Okay, everybody, I'd like to welcome you all, you, you all to the homotopy type theory electronic seminar talks. Um, I think everybody knows the ropes by now, so I'll be very brief with the, uh, the reminders. Um, as usual, the talk is being recorded, and if the speaker agrees afterwards, we will make the video available. Um, the standard procedure, if you want to ask a question, is just to unmute your microphone and, and interrupt the speaker and ask your question. Um, I will try to look at the chat window as well, but I may miss that as I'll be paying attention to the talk. Um, when you are done asking your question, please re-mute your microphone, and if you don't do so, I may do it for you, especially if there's an echo. Uh, the talk will last roughly 60 minutes, and we'll have up to 30 minutes afterwards for discussion. And I think that's all the reminders I wanted to give, so I will just jump in and introduce the speaker, Ulrich Buchholz from the Technische Universität Darmstadt. And his title is From Higher Groups to Homotopy Surfaces. And we need to unmute you, Ulrich. There you go, you're unmuted. Oh. Not now I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do today is I will uh, start off with some fairly well-known territory, namely how to do higher group theory in homotopy type theory. Um, but not everybody is familiar with it, uh, so I would like to, to recall some of the basics and um, talk about some of the formalization work uh, that I've been doing together with uh, Ekber Reike and Floris van Dorn. And then in the second part of the talk, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, surfaces up to homotopy. Um, and this is about some other recent work together with Pavonia, uh, which has inspired me to think about this, and we'll, we'll get to that shortly. So here's the, um, the table of contents. Uh, okay, so uh, as I just said, we will cover some basic definitions. I'll talk about some formalization work in lean, and then I will talk about um, the beginnings of how to do higher group theory in homotopy type theory. Um, many of the things that hopefully are familiar from one group theory, you can also do in infinity group theory. And then the second part is stuff about surfaces. Okay, any questions so far? Good. So, um, so the basic idea is that we are using the homotopy hypothesis to study uh, infinity groups within uh, homotopy type theory because um, homotopy types are the same as infinity groups. And in fact, this uh, is a dictionary. You can go back and forth. Um, and rather, I should say, um, uh, infinity group, weak infinity groupoids are homotopy types. So therefore, if you look at a pointed connected uh, type, uh, that gives you a, a group and not a groupoid. And the, uh, the carrier, if you start with a pointed connected type B, the carrier is simply the loop space at the base point. So the paths from the base point to itself and the group structure is induced from the structure on the uh, identity types. So the neutral element is the identity path and the group operation is given by path concatenation. So there are several equivalent uh, definitions of the type of infinity groups. Uh, put three here. You could either say uh, you have the carrier and then you pair it together with its looping the, the type BG such that G is the loop space on BG. Um, or perhaps more conveniently, you start with a, a pointed type and then you, uh, you have a, the de-looping, but then you need a pointed equivalence. Of course, one of the, uh, by contracting away the, using the vacuum cord principle, you can, you can just remember the, the de-looping type BG. So, um, but if you do that, then you have to remember that what we think of the, as the carrier is not that, that type itself, but rather the loop space of it. And we can look at uh, filtration of it by looking at um, the objects where the carrier is truncated. So here it's n minus one truncated. It, it will give you an n group. Think about the case n equal to um, n equal to one. Then we want the carrier to be a set, so a zero type. That's why. Um, have this notation that the carrier will have uh, information only um, levels below n. Where does the term carrier come from and what should I be thinking about when you say it? 
you should be thinking of when you define an algebraic structure, you give um, the, some stuff, um, which is, and here I think that, that, is, it, that is whatever carries the structure with properties. So I, th I think that's a common in, the, in uh, formalizing algebra, uh, this terminology, but it may not be so familiar to mathematicians, but it's the, 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 the type of, of stuff on which you, you, you equip with operations and structure. Other questions? So then there's this phenomenon. So if, um, so if, if, so now we're looking at these uh, groups, which are types with the delooping. And uh, I think it's familiar to most of you that if you have more deloopings, then you get uh, better properties on the, on the carrier, on the, on, the, on the group structure. So for instance, if you have a double loop space, then uh, there the, concatenation of uh, group elements will be homotopic commutative. So we can define these types of uh, k times uh, deloopable uh, n types. So that's uh, n comma k g types. So it's k fold groupable n types. You can also think of it, read it like that. And again, there are a couple of equivalent definitions. Uh, the most parsimonious one says it's a pointed type, which is uh, k minus one connected and n plus k uh, truncated, uh, or you could pair it up. If you want uh, an, an infinite number of deloopings, then you, of course, you can't uh, vacuum court away uh, the uh, lower dimensional data anymore, and you have to remember all the deloopings. So an uh, infinite, uh, infinitely deloopable uh, n type is given by this whole sequence of deloopings, and because I'm only interested in the structure uh, uh, on the carrier type together with its uh, operations and the um, operations witnessing uh, homotopic commutativity and higher coherences, but I'm not interested in the lower dimensional, um, what it would be uh, structure in negative dimensions. Uh, we, we require that the uh, kth delooping is um, k minus one uh, connected. Okay, so we have this family of the loopings plus uh, witnessing uh, uh, witnessing equivalences plus some co coherences. Okay, so um, so infinite loop types are precisely connective spectra, and I will show a picture uh, showing how this fits in. Okay, so this is the picture of the periodic table of k tuple groupal n groupoids. I should say this is very much inspired by. Uh, paper by John Bias and Jim Dolan. I'll put references at the end of the slides and hopefully the slides will also be available for download both at the hardest website and on my website uh, afterwards. Okay, so what do we have here? We have um, the N going uh, horizontally from left to right. We start with zero types and one types, two types and so on. And we can also uh, just forget about the truncation requirement. We get um, the untruncated version. And k goes downwards um, as for how many uh, deloopings we have. So k is zero, we just have a, um, a point. Uh, but if uh, k is one, we have first delooping. k is two, we have two deloopings, uh, and so on. Okay, and these have various uh, familiar names. And part of the stuff we formalized is um, the n equals to zero column that this is uh, correct. Um, I'll come back to that later. But um, if uh, you have a ordinary a set that is deloopable then it's a group and if it has two deloopings then it's an abelian group and if you have more then you don't gain anything and that's what i've indicated with these ditto marks uh, but if you have a two group that is uh, you have a one type with a group structure which is coherent and so on but because it's given by uh, loops on some other pointed connected uh, two type then um then you get two extra levels of symmetric structure by asking for more deloopings. You can have a braided two group, uh, and then you can have even more symmetry if you get a symmetric two group, but then it stabilizes. Okay. Something we also formalized is, um, is that this stabilization behavior uh, is correct. Okay. Good. Um, well, I should also say that uh, you can think of spectra in this way as um, infinity groups that have, uh, that are, symmetric as much as possible, and they also have uh, cells in negative dimensions. Uh, 
So here's something that we have uh, formalized, um, we being me, uh, Flores, and Egbert. Um, the first thing is just a sanity check that about you know what kind of type is the type of uh, NK types and uh, how truncated is the type of homomorphisms, the homomorphisms being, being given by uh, pointed maps between the uppermost loopings. So the way to get the, maybe you should read this slide from the bottom up. So the, the corollary at the bottom says that the type of NK G types is N plus one truncated. So remember the column uh, N equal to zero, giving you the ordinary pointed sets, groups and abelian groups, all of those are uh, one types. Uh, so you get this as the N equal to zero instance. Okay, now the corollary in the middle talks about um, the type of homomorphisms and uh, we have a general statement that if X is K minus one connected and Y is N plus K truncated, then the type of pointed maps is N truncated. Uh, so in particular, so if you take a G and H to be um, in, in K G types, then uh, the type of homomorphisms is an N type. And that implies the corollary at the bottom by looking at the um, uh, at the maps, the homomorphisms, which are equivalences. Okay, but how do we prove the corollary in the middle there? We have to do an induction, and to get that induction going, uh, we need to look at not just pointed maps, but um, pointed pi types. So that's the theorem there at the, at the top, and that's provable by, um, by induction on n. So you have a uh, K minus one connected pointed type, and you have a family of N plus K truncated uh, pointed types. And then the type of pointed sections, this pointed pi type uh, is N truncated. Any questions? Very good. Um, so that has been formalized. And uh, here's the announced uh, results on the n equal to zero column of the periodic table. Here we have not only equivalences of types, but equivalences of uh, univalent one categories. Um, the, the first line is uh, a tautology, but the second two lines have a little bit of content to them. Um, so the, the, the point in the table where I wrote we'd get groups, we actually have groups and it matches the, uh, the homomorphisms also match and the type where we had abelian groups and the dittos below abelian groups, all of those are equivalent to the categories, the category of abelian groups. Then we formalized some uh, operations for moving about the, um, the periodic table. Um, so here are the operations we formalized. We formalized that you can uh, decategorify by forgetting some of the higher dimensional structure you can do a discrete categorification by forgetting that you were truncated. Um, you can take loops or you can de-loop. I'll show you these on the table in a little bit. And you can uh, forget that you have more de-loopings, which is okay, I have, if I have three de-loopings and I certainly have two, uh, and there's a stabilization map that, um, that gives you more de-loopings, but may squish the type somewhat. So here's how, how that looks. For the, uh, Categorification and decategorification direction. Here, the you should have some colors. The blue arrows um, simply forget uh, the truncation levels, and is correspond to the discrete categorification direction. So that moves you from the left to the right. You could also uh, do that, you know, compose them and even compose them infinitely often. So you could go, for instance, from uh, include two groups inside infinity groups, and the map from the right to the left. Um, truncates away uh, the high dimensional structure. And again, you can do, do that uh, from starting from infinity groups down to one of the finite, uh, finite levels, okay? And we've formalized part of that this is a, an adjunction and um, that if you first, if you embed something rather discrete and then truncate away what you, you didn't have to begin with, then you're back where you started. You first take the discrete categorification and then decategorify, you end up where you start. Okay. 
So here's the, uh, the looping and de-looping directions. They go in these diagonals. So maybe an interesting thing to look at is if you start at abelian groups and then you have, uh, you have, you have two de-loopings, but if you only look at the first de-looping, then you get a, a two group. Um, and uh, you can also go the other way by just taking the, the loop space of a, of a two group that gives you an abelian group or likewise from any of the other places. You can start anywhere in this diagram. Go, go diagonal. Okay. Um, finally, for the stabilization, there's a little more to prove. Uh, the stabilization operation, remember, goes, um, goes down and the forgetful operation goes up and stabilization is left adjoint to forgetting. And so again, read this slide from the bottom to the top. Um, the stabilization theorem tells us that if we are below this uh, diagonal uh, line, where the ditto marks were, then uh, stabilization is an equivalence. And if you're in the stable range, then, um, then you are in infinite loop space. Okay, and this is a rather easy corollary. Uh, in one, on one half is uh, the Freudenthal suspension theorem. Uh, and the other part uses uh, the wedge connectivity uh, lemma. And uh, the way we use the wedge connectivity lemma is, uh, we, so the Freudenthal has to do with the unit map for the loop suspension adjunction. And uh, if you specialize the inclusion of a wedge into a product, uh, if you pull that back along the diagonal, you get the co-unit um, of the loop suspension adjunction. And that is the other half of the stabilization theorem once we know uh, the wedge connectivity lemma. Uh, just an aside, in book card, this, uh, this wedge connectivity lemma is uh, kind of annoying to prove. It's not exactly the version that's stated in the book. The version in the book is a little more streamlined, but if you actually want this map to be disconnected, then you have to fiddle with some higher path algebra. This is all in the formalization. Okay, very good. So what about some examples? Uh, well, we can, of course, do um, a lot of ordinary group theory uh, from this point of view. I think it's, uh, it's interesting that um, maybe if you want to define the integers in hot, you just say you should define them from this point of view as the loop space on the circle. That is the sort of the natural definition of, of the integers. It's the free, um, free infinity group on one generator, and it turns out to be a one group. You can also get other uh, free groups on pointed sets, uh, free abelian groups. Um, I should mention that there is an open problem um, about whether if you have a pointed set where you don't know that it has um, decidable equality, then we, we actually don't know whether the free infinity group on that pointed set is a one group. Um, but there was some recent work by Torsten um, and a co-author uh, that, that at least made some progress on this, but didn't solve it uh, outright. Okay. Um, one important class of examples come from automorphism groups. So if you have any type, a capital A, and you have a point in this type, little a, you, the type of paths inside capital A, so A equals A, uh, this is the automorphism group of this uh, A, and the de-looping is the image in, of the map from the terminal type in A uh, that points at a little a. So it's the type of all the x's in A, which are merely equal to little a. Um, if you truncate, you get the fundamental n group of a pointed type. Um, then there is something interesting you can do for other uh, one groups, say the symmetric groups. You get those, of course, as the automorphism group of an n element set. So the, uh, the de-looping or the classifying type here is uh, the type of small n element sets. And uh, I should say, if you want to know more about fun, to do, fun things to do with uh, this kind of classifying uh, types, you should read a blog post that Mike Schulman wrote that I will link to at the end. Um, other fun things you can do with the symmetric groups is you can take a co-limit and that gives you maybe a convenient uh, place to do uh, abstract syntax with weakening built in and, and uh, alpha renaming. So that's another project I'm working on at the moment. Um, quite generally, if you have any one group, you can take uh, BG, the D-looping, to be the type of uh, G torsos. 
Um, so going back to the integers, uh, the circle has a further de-looping, which we can take to be the type of uh, oriented circles. And generalizing a bit, uh, if we have these um, automorphism groups of spheres and pointed spheres, which I'll come back to later. So I write Gn for the automorphism group of the n minus one sphere and Fn for the pointed automorphisms of the pointed n sphere. And then it turns out that if you take co-limits along the suspension maps, uh, that gives you equivalent groups. And uh, there are homomorphisms to the two element groups that uh, ask for the set of um, or orientations on a sphere, there are always uh, two. And uh, so this gives you a homomorphism from Gn or Fn to uh, the two element group. And um, if you take the kernel, you get the orientation preserving automorphisms. Okay, uh, there are lots of other things one would like to do. For instance, we would like to have um, unitary groups and orthogonal groups. And uh, it's an open problem how to define these in ordinary book card but maybe at least with cohesion, we should be able to, to get them. We don't know whether they are definable, just in something like Okay. Um, now groups are of course made to act on uh, objects and an action uh, of a group from this point of view is a homomorphism into an uh, automorphism group. So that means that if you want an action on types, that is simply a function into a universe. Because that will, because BG is always connected, that would land inside um, the automorphism group of X of the point. Okay. If you have such an action on types, you can form the homotopy fixed points or invariants, that's just the pi type. And you can form the core invariance or the homotopy quotient or the homotopy orbit space, which is just the sigma type. So that's rather nice. And there, these operations are, of course, um, right and left adjoints to the um, operation from types to G types that equips, uh, that gives A a trivial action, which is this constant at A. Okay. And we can prove some beginning propositions about actions. So here's one. If you have a, a, homomorphisms, a homomorphism of higher groups given by a, a de-looping, BF, and you have a map of G-types, that is just a, a map of the, of the fibers, uh, then we can compose these actions with F to get uh, H actions on X and Y. And then we have a homotopy pullback relating all the uh, homotopy quotients. So here's an um, application of that um, by considering the, the actions of a group on itself. There are two canonical actions, the right action and the adjoint action. So the right action, uh, so it's supposed to be a map from BG to the universe and uh, the right action at X is the path from the point to X. So you see if you have some Path from X to Y, you can concatenate uh, the path you get from the point to X, and then you get a new path from the point to Y. The adjoint action is uh, simply the family of types given by the self, uh, the loops at X. And there you can check that the action is by conjugation. So you have the, the trivial action on one and take the, uh, the orbits by G, you get BG. And if you take the uh, orbits of the action, the right action uh, by the then you get the trivial type. If you take the um, orbits by the adjoint action, you get the free loop space. So this tells you uh, another viewpoint of this is that uh, the free maps from S1 to BG, recalling that S1 is uh, the de-looping of the integers, is the same as a conjugacy class of an element in G. So here's uh, the corollary of the proposition on the previous slide. If you have a homomorphism uh, of higher groups inducing uh, an H action on G, then the uh, orbit space is equivalent to the uh, homotopy fiber of the de-looping presenting the homomorphism. So here's, I just want to advertise that maybe you've heard this before, but we can define projective spaces for any group and 
particularly we can recover the real and complex projective spaces. And if we knew of the, uh, the definition of um, um, the de-looping of the three sphere corresponding to the, the quaternions, the unit quaternions, then we would also get the quaternionic projective spaces. So the definition for any group is that you have um, uh, G acting on the iterated joins of the right action with itself. And call this, this is inspired by what's called the Milner construction. And um, one can calculate how connected um, the types we're acting on are here. And uh, the co-limit will turn out to be intractable and uh, the projective spaces are the corresponding quotients. So for the cases of the real and complex projective spaces, we take iterated joins either of the, um, of the Booleans, the two, the zero sphere or the one sphere, so we get higher spheres and then we have the, uh, the corresponding quotients by the actions of the, um, the first orthogonal group or the first uh, unitary group up to homotopy, viewed as a homotopy type. Okay. There's another very trivial thing you can do for any uh, infinity group. And if you have a, an, a G type, so an action of G on type X. And if you have a point uh, in this uh, type, so by, uh, by this I mean X of the point, so we can define the stabilizers group uh, of X. And that is, um, this is the de-looping of, um, of the, um, it's a stabilizer group. So, so what I want to say, I want to say it's just the automorphisms of the, um, uh, of, the rep of the class uh, represented by X, okay? And then the orbit of X is, um, we can define that to be the type of um, points in the, in the image of the action uh, of the group you know, restricted to that, to little X. So it's all the Y's which become equal so that the class of X is equal to the class of Y, merely. Okay, this, uh, clear definition of the orbit, and then it's a trivial uh, calculation that we get uh, an infinity version of the orbit stabilizers theorem. So the homotopy quotient of G by the stabilizer is uh, equivalent to the orbit of X. And the proof is very simple. Uh, the map from the stabilizer group to G, so it's given by the projection from this type of triples. Um, so you have, um, an element of BG and you have the Y, so that's Z, you have Y and X of Z. So that pairs together it represents a point in the orbit. And then you, uh, to be in the stabilizer group of X, you have to say that uh, this point in the orbit space is merely equal to the class of X. And the homomorphism from BHX to BG is the projection down to BG and then we know that when you have a projection, then the fiber is just given by the rest of the data. Um, so the fiber over the point is, exa is exactly the orbit, the, the y's and x of the point, such that the class of x equals the class of uh, y. So I, I think that's very neat. And I hope there are lots of other um, things that one could do. But obviously, I mean, developing all of group theory for higher groups will be an endeavor for many years. Uh, some of it have already been done by homotopy theorists, but I think there's maybe some new perspectives that we can add from the point of view of uh, homotopy type theory. Okay, so here's another thing we can do. We can classify central extensions and do group cohomology. Indeed, um, the cohomology of a group is just the cohomology of its de-looping. So if you have a spectrum A, you can define the uh, case group cohomology uh, group of G with coefficients in A to be the set of uh, pointed maps from uh, BG to the case de-looping uh, of A. But of course, if we just want that particular group, we only need um, K-fold de-loopings of A's. So we don't need a full spectrum. Um, so for instance, if we have uh, just a braided infinity group, so we have two de-loopings, then we can define the second cohomology group. Uh, of which an element gives rise to a, a central extension um, of G by A. And as a cute little example of that, 
And so you, you get this, uh, if you have the, uh, the element C, you get the extension by taking um, homotopy fibers. So the example is um, that you, obviously there's a central extension of the integers by um, the cyclic group of order N, it turns out to be the integers again. And um, uh, that is classified by the map. So if the, the classifying type of the cyclic group, uh, that is the type of uh, cyclically ordered N element sets. So uh, an N a, a set, a, a type, which is merely equal to uh, this set of N elements and which has, which comes equipped with a cyclic ordering. Uh, and you can think of that as um, an equivalence of the type with itself that tells you uh, for every element, which one is the next one and says that, the, uh, that this, this, this has uh, precisely an N cycle. Um, so if you have such a type, which is an uh, N element set with a cyclic ordering, you can get a, an oriented circle by gluing together uh, each point in the N element set with its successor. And uh, turns out that this map uh, represents this uh, central extension. Okay. Any, uh, any questions about sort of stuff before I move on? I want to, uh, uh, I put a reference to a paper by uh, Nikolaus Schreiber and Stevenson at the end uh, where they developed some of this from the point of view of infinity topos some years ago. And um, I think there's much more that could be said. Um, and I hope some of you will be interested in, in looking into this as well. Okay, now uh, I will get to, to the surfaces. So remember we had these um, um, spherical, uh, the classifying types of spherical bundles. And uh, let's uh, make, make some use of those. So here's the motivation for how I got into to thinking about this. I was looking at the, uh, the homotopy type theory wiki and I was looking at the open problem section and I found this uh, listed. Um, so in the book, there's a definition of the torus and one can also consider projective space and client bottles and so on. And the open problem is to show that the client bottle is not orientable. And this requires defining what it means to be orientable. And, um, and this is, I want to give a cheap solution to this open problem. And then I want to say that this is not the real solution. And then I want to propose a program to define, uh, to, to give it an, an actual solution. Okay, so here's uh, the cheap solution. Uh, we can define the, the tangent bundle, which would be a uh, family of circles over the client bottle. And there are many ways to think, to, to see that this will not lift to the, um, to the oriented uh, circle bundles. And I'll show you a, a diagram on the next page. I wanna preempt this, pre prevent, preempt any criticism by saying, of course, this is not a, a satisfactory solution to the problem because we don't know, um, I mean, the, the tangent, we, this doesn't say that the tangent bundle is the tangent bundle of a circle, it's just some random circle bundle uh, of, the, of the client bottle, but it's just some random. Uh, we have to develop some theory to say that it's actually a surface uh, equipped with this structure. Okay, but I wanna draw a picture of the tangent bundle for the Klein bottle now. Okay, so you get the Klein bottle by starting with a square and then you glue together the left and the right edge in opposite orders. So you identify here the two sides labeled P, but you make a twist. So you get yourself a Möbius band and then you identify the top and the bottom as well. So, yeah. A little hard to, uh, to draw, but uh, at least this is how you make it. Now let's think about um, what the tangent bundle is. So I wanna compare the unit spheres inside the tangent spaces. Um, so there's only one, as a cell complex, there's only one point, And then we have these two, um, uh, two paths. And then we have, we're gluing in the square. So let's start by uh, looking at one corner of the square and seeing what the unit tangent uh, tangents look like. So say we start by uh, using the positive orientation on the circle and going up towards the Q edge. 
Then that'll come out uh, on the bottom of the square and go up to the left edge, uh, still with positive orientation. But now we see that we have to come to the other side of the P edge, and now we're on the other side and we've been swept, flipped over. So we've changed orientation. And now we come back again on the top side of the Q edge and we come back uh, where we started. So if we uh, look at what's going on here, it means we have a circle at the base point and when you uh, want to give a path from that oriented from that circle to itself by going on the P edge, you use the same orientation. But when you go along the Q edge, you have to swap the orientation. Um, and this tells you that if you thicken up the Q edge a bit, you have a, um, you have a Möbius strip inside there, which means that the surface uh, can't be orientable. So this, uh, I, I, like, I like this view of thinking about uh, classifying uh, types because what we're literally doing is we're making a, a map from this type into this, the type of circles, uh, of types merely e equal to the circle. And it's, uh, I think it's very hands-on uh, compared to what you're doing in traditional uh, home type theory. Okay. So now why is uh, this solution to this open problem not, um, not quite satisfactory? Well, I think to give a real solution, you should define uh, the actual type of surfaces. You should define um, the type of oriented uh, surfaces with a forgetful map to the actual type of, uh, to the type of all surfaces. And then you could define the type of orientable surfaces to be the image uh, of this map. And then you could, for instance, prove that um, there are exactly two ways to orient any orientable uh, surface. And one could, um, to, I should, you know, to, to go back to the Klein bottle, one should show that um, uh, an orientation corresponds to a lifting of, that should be, you should be define the tangent bundle of, this, uh, of, a, of a surface, at least uh, and for the for all surfaces, it'd be a, a non-oriented circle bundle and then you should show that um, if this surface is orientable if and only if there exists a lift uh, to the oriented circle bundles and these uh, lifts correspond to the lifts uh, to the points in the pre-image uh, of the forgetful map from oriented surfaces to surfaces. And then one could also um, hope to do more things rather than just solve this one problem one could work on um, on other aspects, for instance, one could perhaps try to prove the classification theorem for surfaces. And one could see whether this was constructive. Um, for instance, one could see if it was fully constructive, you, we would be able to decide if we had a, an element in the type of surfaces, um, whether, um, whether it was orientable or not, and compute the genus and so on. Uh, just a moment. Okay, um, and of course, what, el what else should we have? We should have some more uh, properties of this type of surfaces. Uh, for instance, the identity type should be the right things. That's uh, the sine qua non of having a correct definition of something in heart. Um, okay, here's a picture of some surfaces, some orientable surfaces to uh, lighten things up a bit. Okay. Now, how are we going to define this type of surfaces? And here, uh, my proposal is to look uh, into uh, the type of Franco rate reality types, types of Franco rate reality spaces. And of course, you can define this for an arbitrary n. Uh, so, an n dimensional Franco rate reality type um, is going to be a type that is merely equivalent to a finite complex. And together with an orientation class, which would be a, a family of two element sets and a fundamental class in the homology, in the parameterized homology of X uh, with respect to this uh, orientation class, such as the cap product map uh, in the universal uh, parameterized uh, free group is an isomorphism. That will tell you that you get an isomorphism with arbitrary 
uh, parameterized coefficients. Um, then it's easy to see that if you do this, then the, the, if you have two uh, pairs of an orientation class and a fundamental class, then they're uh, merely equal, uh, then they're equal. Uh, so the, the type um, of the, those pairs, if you have them, is contractile. So it's a mere proposition to be a, uh, a surface, an unoriented surface. Uh, and then the correctness of this proposal for dimension two comes from old work uh, in the beginning of the 80s by um, Benno Ekman and collaborators that every two-dimensional Poincaré duality type um, is equivalent to a closed surface. So it would in fact um, be a correct definition. So what do we have and what do we need? And here's where I want to advertise another recent article, which I'll put the link to at the end of the slides. Um, we already uh, have the type of finite cell complexes with the geometric realization map um, into types. And we know that we can compute the cohomology groups of a finite complex uh, via the associated cellular chain complex. And this has been fully formalized in ACTA now. Uh, this is joint work with Pavonia. Was there a question? Uh, uh, can you go to the uh, previous slide? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear it. Uh, can you go to the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, do you mean that uh, this type is uh, a proposition or that it's contractible? Since... Uh, yeah, I mean, the, um, if it means, yeah, if you have an inhabitant, then it is contractible. So it is a proposition. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes. Um, okay, so we have, we know how to compute uh, cohomology on, on finite complexes. Um, we also have, uh, yeah, well, I want to let me say this was actually a major effort uh, to fully formalize uh, this results, and I'm very happy to announce that it's it's done and it's in this is in ACTA. It's in the standard uh, the hot ACTA library. Okay, we also have uh, the necessary uh, cup product for integral coefficients, and therefore also the cap product, and uh, slightly more work we could get um, the cup and cap product maps for. Uh, free abelian coefficients, possibly twisted by uh, an automorphism group of the integers. What we still need to do, uh, I think, partly to define all the standard surfaces and prove that they are Poincaré duality two types, is to extend the work on cellular cohomology to the parameterized case and uh, to do the case for a homology. So, uh, developing enough homology theory is. Um, more work than anticipated because it's difficult to prove uh, enough uh, facts about the smash product uh, to make everything go through. But we, uh, many people are now working on that. And uh, I think we are, we are approaching the point where it's doable to formalize. And then of course, once we have that, we can construct all the usual surfaces. Uh, they're all uh, KG ones, uh, but to give the Poincaré duality structure, uh, you have to glue in that extra, you have to glue them together correctly as cell, as cell structures in a way that's known from beginning courses in um, algebraic topology, and then uh, prove um, Poincaré duality for them. And um, it would be cool if, to see if we could do the, the classification theorem. Um, and to, to, for this, fact about orientations, we would need the correspondence between um, orientation of a surface, orientation of the corresponding uh, stable normal bundle, and um, the orientations of the dual um, tangent bundles, at least the stable tangent bundle. And there are a bunch of facts about spherical vibrations that we should be able to prove and formalize uh, quite easily, for instance, that um, there, there exist inverses to stable spherical vibrations over the finite complexes. There's not an inverse operations on the classifying type of stable spherical bundles itself, but if you have a stable spherical bundle on a finite um, complex, then there exists uh, an inverse uh, to Whitney sum. And um, 
a sum, a, a, a stable spherical bundle is uh, orientable if and only if its inverse is, and uh, something that is uh, given by a non-stable class is orientable if and only if the stabilization is orientable. And, and that would be a way of going, mediating between the argument I just sketched for the actual tangent bundle of the Klein bottle uh, and the uh, orientation of the surface in, in the sense of concrete duality. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, um, so what the second part is, uh, is proposing is uh, there are a lot more formalization we can do, I think, in this direction, and I think it would be quite interesting. And if anyone is interested to, to work on this, please uh, let me know. Um, I don't know whether using punk ray duality two types is the most efficient way to represent the type of surfaces. There might be better ways. Uh, first idea is to go to the spectrum level punk ray duality, but maybe there are other simplifications that one can make. Uh, then it would be nice to generalize to surfaces with boundary. Uh, this would give us uh, access in a sort of categorified uh, univalent way to braid groups and classical mapping class groups. And one could hope to prove some uh, instances of homological stability that are of interest to uh, homotopy theorists uh, today. Um, of course, it would be interesting to study uh, the cohesive versions of this, in which case one could prove that the, um, the punk ray reality two types actually come from uh, smooth or analytic structures. Um, another thing one can do with finite complexes is uh, since we have the serospectral sequence for cohomology, you should all know that that has been completely formalized in lean. Um, Flores is now also working on the spare sets, the serospectral sequence for homology. And once we have that, we can hope to prove um, Brown's theorem that homotopy groups of finite complexes are computable. And then one could try to compute them and then see that probably one can't do it with this algorithm because it takes too long, uses too much memory, but it would be nice to have in, in principle. Okay, um, I think I ended a little early, but I hope it's okay. We have time for the questions. Here are the, uh, the references. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much, Ulrich. That was, that was great. I'm gonna unmute everyone so we can all thank Ulrich. For... <laughs> There we go. Okay, so um, now I'll open the floor to questions. Okay, I'll uh, break the ice and ask one. Um, Ulrich, the last point you made about Brown's uh, theorem about computability, can you say a bit more about how you think um, you know, the things you talked about would help with that? Um, because my understanding was his method was, um, was very combinatorial in a sense. So I'd just be curious what you think the connection is. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, for a lot of this, uh, there's a lots of combina uh, combinatorial statements to prove and lots of uh, facts about groups. And, um, and that's not going to go away. But one can uh, relate the combinatorial work, which is a heavy part of it, which is also a heavy part of the formalization project on the serospectral sequence. One can for, uh, relate this to the actual homotopy types. And I think that's, uh, that's where, it's where we, what we can do in homotopy type theory. We can actually link up the algebraic and combinatorial work to the homotopy types. Okay. Um, so I have a question that you, what you sketched is already really cool and ambitious. So this is a weird question, but it seems to me like this might relate to some, have you thought about any notions of a uh, cobordism theory in this context or once manifolds enter the picture, does it just, you give up? Uh, no, certainly it's very interesting to look at uh, cobordisms of surfaces. Uh, it's part of also what you, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know exactly what, 
you know, what is the classical theorem to, to aim for, but uh, it's something that would be available to study once we set up this machinery. Um, one can also, that there's, one can look at cobordism for relative Poincaré reality in pairs. Um, and, but I think uh, it might, it might be too complicated from a classical perspective. I think maybe you, it ends up being at least as complicated as homotopy groups of spheres, I think. Um, whereas if you, well, I, maybe, I, I don't actually remember the, the classical theory. Maybe I should, I should not. And I'll just say that it's possible to start uh, studying, studying this, at least for the frank rate reality uh, pairs. And then in, low, in the two dimensional case, that's related to the, uh, uh, to the actual smooth uh, notion. Uh, in higher dimensions, it's, uh, there are some obstructions to going from a punk grid reality pair to a smooth uh, closed manifold. Uh, and I think in dimension three, it's still actually open whether all uh, punk grid reality three types uh, are geometrically realizable. Um, does anyone know if that's still open? I think it's, I think it's still open. Next question. Question about the first part of the talk. Uh, you said something about abstract syntax and um, uh, weakening or something like that. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Um, I'm sorry, if anyone could, could you either repeat it or I, someone could repeat I the can, question? I can repeat it. He, he said that in the early part of your talk, you said something about abstract syntax and weakening. And oh, yes. Elaborate on that. Yes. Uh, let me just go back to where we had. Here we are. Um, so a type with an action of the symmetric group on n letters, you can think of that as um, a type with the parameterized by n free variables, and the action gives you the alpha renaming. Now, the map from BSN to BSN plus one uh, is given by sending an, 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 an anonymous N element set to X, say to X plus one. That will have N plus one elements merely if X has N elements merely. And this corresponds to weakening. So if you, uh, you, so if you, if you take the limit of that, that means that you, have, you can have the type of uh, some kind of stuff which can have some finite number of variables and you can freely weaken and commute the variables. And I'm developing a library of abstract syntax based on this idea. It's not quite the Shannonwell topos and of nominal sets because we don't enforce, um, in this approach, we don't enforce the finite support uh, property of a type. But if you define say uh, abstract syntax inductively, that will turn out to always have finite support and uh, so, so I have a little library that I'm playing with of relating um, abstract syntax indexed by BS infinity uh, to other notions of abstract syntax. I also have some slides on my webpage that you can go look up for how this is going to work. More questions? Um, I'll ask another one. Uh, so you mentioned n manifolds in response to another question. Do you think there's any hope in characterizing n manifolds? You know, which Poincare duality n types are n manifolds? Uh, certainly, I think the, the classical theory, the surgery approach, the algebraic surgery approach. Uh, that you can probably do at least when you have the real things to compare with. Um, so, some of the work is purely homotopy theoretical and you can already, you can perhaps define the abstraction, but you need, you need to have, say on this slide I have here, I have uh, BON and BUN, and uh, you can also look, take the columns, but you need to have these types in order to have the map from say BO to BG, uh, B curly G. And the, the, the fiber of that, would, which would be uh, G mod O. And th those kinds of groups uh, and their, their cosets appear in this uh, surgery work on when you can lift 
say, this BVAC normal bundle from B st stable uh, spherical bundles to uh, stable orthogonal bundles and so on. So I think you need to be in a cohesive setting as, at least for the moment in order to uh, make sense of that. But then you could probably try to formalize th that, um, that important work by, you know, Sullivan, Renitsky, and so on. Just to follow up on that, um, uh, do you have any thought about uh, how constructive that might be in that co cohesion uh, approach to relating that? If you're likely to use some classical logic there or not? Um, I'd say that's, so far, I don't know that it's uh, not constructive, but that this, this could be just a sign of ignorance. It could well be that there's some place where it's fundamentally non constructive. We haven't heard a question from Torsten yet, so something must be going wrong. I, I don't have a question, but a comment. Uh, so this this this, uh, this open question the, um, about whether the, the free group of a set is a set, uh, it's actually uh, Nikolai Kraus, and I'm on mm. the second author. Yeah. Correct this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I guess I'll make a last call for questions. All right, well, then let us all thank Ulrich again. Okay, it always takes me a second to re mute. There we go. Okay, so that's it for today. And our next talk is in two weeks. And the speaker then will be Mike Schulman, who will be telling us about type two theory. So that's April 12th. Thanks for participating. We'll see you then.